but uh, it has the potential to be here soon. And let's see if I can. Okay. So um, I know many of you are plants per persons and uh, probably know much more about the different trees than I do, but um, just a little bit of background about the ash tree that we're going to be talking about specifically today first. Um, ash is a tree in the genus Fraxinus. It's a genus of flowering trees in the Oleaceae family. We have uh, 21 different kinds of ash trees in North America. Um, these are opposite, some, one of the few trees with opposite branching. Uh, the leaves are pinnate and usually uh, pinnate leaf compound, sometimes with uh, serrated serrations on the teeth, sometimes uh, uh, smooth, but um, a very common uh, group of trees. The seeds, uh, one of the most distinctive features of the ash tree are, are its seeds. Uh, they're born in, in uh, flat single Samaras, uh, similar to about half of a maple Samara, I guess, uh, if, you're, if you know maples. Um, they're dioecious trees. Uh, they have both male and female trees. So only half the trees would you see the seeds on them like this. Um, very popular shade tree, has dense hardwood that, uh, with lots of, lots of uh, commercial uses, and um, these are just some of the things that we do with ash. Uh, everything from baseball bats to electric guitars. Um, they're very, the ash wood, because of its flexibility and strength, is used for things like oars and uh, railroad ties and, and bows, uh, and bows and arrows, and so uh, it's a very useful, very useful wood. It's the principal wood that, until recently, it's been the principal wood used by the Major League Baseball leagues um, for, for bats. Um, so the critter that we're going to talk about today is emerald ash borer. Uh, emerald ash borer uh, scientifically is known as a gorillus planipennis. Uh, it's a, a beetle in the family Buprestidae, the flat-headed borers. Um, emerald ash borer is a native of Asia. It was first detected in the U.S. in Detroit, Michigan in 2002. Now that was the first time we detected it. Um, going back and looking at records later, researchers in Michigan had guesstimated that it's probably been there since the 1990s, early 1990s. So it may have taken eight to ten years for us to discover this infestation. By 2003, uh, just one year later, the uh, damage was highly evident, and there were five to seven million dead or dying ash trees in just a six-county area of, north, of southeastern Michigan. So uh, once, once this insect gets on a roll, uh, the damage uh, um, just gets evident very quickly. So you can see from this picture, it's not a big insect, uh, maybe the, barely the width of a fingernail. Um, it is a shining green insect. Uh, until, until this was found in the U.S., there was actually very little known about it. Um, like we said, it was, it's from Asia. The range comes from China, Korea, and East Russia. So um, that's where it was initially known from, but um, researchers that uh, started doing literature searches on this uh, beetle uh, found very little information. There were two pages about it in a Chinese textbook and a few taxonomic descriptions in journals, but other than that, there was hardly anything written about this insect. Apparently in China <coughs> and these in Korea and Russia, it's not a, <coughs> excuse me, it's not a major pest problem there, so uh, there just really wasn't a lot of written liter literature on this insect. So emerald ash borer attacks all species of ash trees. Uh, in the U.S., it attacks not just weak trees, but also vigorous, healthy trees that are well-established, living in perfect uh, environments. It doesn't really matter. This, this beetle is uh, able to be, serve as a primary borer and be able to attack these trees. And it, it attacks not just uh, urban street situations, but also, like I said, in forests and, and native habitats as well. Um, in Michigan, they found... Uh, over 99% mortality of forest ash trees with stems that are greater than um, a couple of inches. So these these uh, insects are are very devastating uh, and have been uh, to the native ash population in the states where where it's been found. 
Um, as far as its impact, how, how it impacts trees, the larvae feed underneath the bark. So it's not the adult um, insect stage that, that kills trees, it's actually the larval stage. Um, you can see in this picture the bark of a, of a dead tree, and you can see all those tu the tunnels right underneath the bark that's from emerald ash borer. And when they, of course, when the insect tunnels, the cambium layer there, phloem layer, uh, they disrupt the transport of water and nutrients for the tree. Usually it takes somewhere between one and three years to kill a tree once it's been first infested with these beetles. And uh, size is not, an, not a limit. They, they will attack all size trees. trees. So this is some data from um, Dr. Dan Herms at Ohio State University. And uh, this is some research that was done uh, in the upper Huron River watershed in southeast Michigan. Now the solid, uh, the dots and the solid lines indicate data that was actually collected um, on ash mortality up in this watershed area. And you can see they have four years of data starting in uh, 2004, um, excuse me, six years of data. In 2004, they had uh, somewhere close to 30% mortality in this forest. And um, by 2010, they had uh, nearly 100% mortality of ash. And, and from those data points, they extrapolated back and this is where some of the um, guesstimate that, that the beetles were probably present for at least 10 years before the first uh, cases were noticed. But in any case, you can see that the ultimate result of a natural infestation of these beetles in a forested area is nearly 100% mortality of ash trees. Now, if this wasn't bad enough, um, we also, last year, um, there was a new host discovered for emerald ash borer. Up until this time, it was thought that the only um, plant that was attacked by these borers were um, Fraxinus, the, the ash genus. But uh, last year, they found uh, researchers in southeast Ohio found live larvae and dead adults in, uh, in a sample of a white fringe tree, Cyananthus virginicus. Um, they found, had evidence on that tree that the uh, Bores had completed their development within the tree, so that's that would be uh, something that's important. Um, it's not just didn't just bore into the tree, but actually was able to successfully reproduce. And uh, it attacked trees, these white fringe trees, in the presence of available ash trees. So it wasn't like it was a host of last resort or anything. So uh, this is something um, you horticulturists uh, might be interested in, and especially if you're in East Texas where this tree might be, might be found natively, um, it is another potential host for these beetles. So this map shows up, up to about last year what the emerald ash borer range in the U.S. was. And each of these orange dots represents a known infestation in the areas where um, the dots are pretty contiguous across the state. You can assume that the infestation is throughout the entire state. As we get out toward the edges, though, um, the infestations are a little more spotty. Now, the thing I wanted you to see on this slide is look at Arkansas. Um, those six dots in Arkansas were finds that occurred last year in 2014 and, uh, and represent some of the closest infestations to Texas right now. And Texas is the little uh, state right in the corner of this map. Hey, Mike, can you uh, go back to the previous uh, slide showing the Kynanthus? I, I just want to uh, point out here, you know, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, Kynanthus, uh, not only Virginicus, but also uh, Chinensis here in the state as an ornamental uh, tree. And then uh, in East Texas, lots of people like to uh, grow uh, Osmanthus, uh, you know, Osmanthus fragrance. That's olive. That's a sweet, uh, sweet olive. And it's a small shrub uh, or big shrub, a small tree, and then olea, that's uh, uh, olive trees. And we do have many acres of, uh, uh, of olives growing in, in Texas. So, uh, so those are uh, potential hosts in, the, in addition to ash trees. And they are, you know, these are popular uh, plants uh, in, in the landscape. Um, so just want to interrupt there. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sure, Meng Meng, thank you for doing that. Um, I'm not as familiar with the the commonality of these plants, but I, sh I should emphasize that right now, as far as we know, the only other species that has been found attacked by uh, by the boar is Kyananthus. So it's just speculation, but probably pretty good speculation that these other plants could be susceptible as well. 
Okay, um, so anyway, this is the range, and uh, this is a little different view, just showing the states, infested states. Um, but I wanted to point out a couple things. Uh, first, notice in this, this map, as of 2015, Kansas and Colorado have had findings of emerald ash borer, and also most recently, Louisiana. And in February of this year, um, some foresters uh, in Louisiana uh, checked out some suspicious-looking trees right, right up near the border of Louisiana and Arkansas and found the borers, uh, found borer damage uh, an active infestation at that site. So that was about 40 miles from Texas. So we've, we've got about 40, 50 miles uh, out right now as far as we know in, in our state. Now this is a map, um, an earlier range map from Illinois and um, I just wanted to point out on this, uh, it's interesting and one of the things that uh, we know about emerald ash borer is that it, it can spread naturally on the ground but it's aided by humans. And um, you'll notice that these infestations seem to follow major highway routes across the state. And that has been the experience with this borer that, um, that it, it is transported by humans. And we think that primarily the principal transport me mechanism is probably firewood. Um, anybody that cuts, cuts down an emerald or an ash tree that's been infested with borers and uses that wood for firewood should not be transporting that firewood out of the area. It should be used locally, but um, as you know, with firewood, that doesn't often happen. So this is going to be have to be a major uh, part of our educational effort if we want to slow the spread of emerald ash borer in Texas. Is is informing people not to transport firewood for fear of it it uh, being infested with these these beetles. So. Um, it turns out that not all ash trees are equally uh, damaged by emerald ash borer. It seems to affect and kill quicker the faster growing species of ash. For example, uh, black ash is supposedly a very fast growing species of ash and it, it seems to die the quickest from emerald ash borer infestation. Green ash, um, that one to three years, um, is probably accurate for most green ash, but it dies much faster than white ash, which is a little more naturally tolerant of the borer. So um, there are some species differences um, between the different ash types. Um, this this slide shows the uh, life cycle of the adult of the of the borer. An adult emergence is is uh, taking place now. Uh, probably started. Uh, late last month and has proceeded through this month. And uh, so the adults are out now. They can live for two to three weeks. The female is going to lay between 65 and 90 eggs during their lifetime uh, under pellets and plates of bark on the tree. The larvae uh, will then hatch and remain active feeding in the tree throughout the winter. And then in late April or May the next year, um, they're going to begin to pupate. Typically what a larva like this does is it gets very close to the surface of the bark, chews all, uh, close to the surface, and then creates a little cell for itself underneath the bark in which it would pupate. And then uh, in May, uh, it, the adult will then come out of the pupil uh, stage and chew its way out of the tree and start the life cycle over again. So it's a one-year life cycle, one generation per year. So how do you recognize emerald ash borer damage? Uh, <clears throat> so this is an adult ash borer looking for an egg laying site. Um, good luck finding an egg. But it is possible uh, to, to see these things. You would not see the any kind of entrance hole into the tree typically with emerald ash borer. But if you were really sharp eyed and, uh, and knew what to look for, you might possibly be able to find an egg. And this is actually an egg that uh, oval-shaped golden brown uh, object in the middle of the slide is actually an emerald ash borer egg under the plate of bark. But good luck finding one of those. It obviously blends in very well. But this is what the female is doing um, during the, sp the spring month, laying eggs under places in the bark. And probably looking for areas of weakness in the bark, maybe if there's been a broken branch or scar a lightning scar or something. In general, borers tend to know those kinds of places and lay their eggs near them. Um, this would be a newly hatched uh, ash borer larva. 
and uh, you can see, uh, I'll make it move here, there's the larva right there if you're not sure what you're looking at. The, the arrow is now pointed directly at the head. Uh, very flat uh, larvae. Uh, the legs are so small that you would not be able to see them, uh, but it's a segmented body. And, and I want you to take, take a look at the shape of the, the uh, tunnel there. We're going to come back to that in a minute. This is pretty diagnostic for emerald ash borer. Um, another view of the larvae, you can see them a little better here. And uh, you'll notice the bell-shaped segments on the body of the larvae. And uh, the flattened head at the, at the top of the larva with that, that uh, line down the middle. Now, there, there are going to be other larvae that can resemble uh, emerald ash. There will be some that look different. So these are the basic features to look for. But if you see something that's like this, it's not absolutely uh, proof that you've got emerald ash borer, but it, it, knowing these basic uh, diagnostic signs will help you rule out other things that you might come across. Very flat insect. Um, just another shot. You can see that again those bell-shaped um, segments really well. There's two terminal uh, cirrhosis at the end of the body there too. So uh, looking on a tree that's infested, this is what you would be likely to see if you looked closely. Now here's that adult borers obviously just come out. You'll notice again they're just a brilliant emerald, uh, metallic emerald green color of the adult beer, beetle. That's going to be characteristic of all the adults. The hole right below the adult, you'll notice that it's D-shaped. It's got a flat side and it's got a round side. And that's typical of the emergence holes of, of bupressed beetle in specific, but but uh, or in general, but um, emerald ash borer specifically will give you that D-shaped hole. So this is damage under the bark caused by the larvae, and um, we call this a serpentine-type damage. You'll notice that uh, the trails go back and forth like a meandering river, and it's very distinctive and characteristic of this particular beetle. So this back and forth, back and forth nature of the of the uh, tunneling is characteristic for EAB. Again, just another view. Just see, it looks like a river, a very highly meandering river. So uh, another uh, symptom that you will see on emerald ash borer is you'll see woodpecker damage or flecking, uh, they call it. And uh, woodpeckers will start to attack uh, trees that are under attack by, they'll start to peck at trees that are under attack by emerald ash borer. So it's a, it's, uh, if you're scouting an area to see if there's ash borer damage in the area, seeing this kind of damage or this kind of damage would be uh, a visual clue and, and cause you want to look a little more closely at that tree. So this is not something that you, you're looking for. Now, again, woodpeckers are always pecking at trees. It doesn't, if you've got woodpecker damage, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got emerald ash borer, but if you're in a risk zone, high risk zone, and uh, there are ash borers in the area, then this would be something you might want to take a little closer look at. Um, if you have a tree that you think possibly could be damaged by emerald ash borer, um, pruning off some of the branches or limbs and, and, um, and cutting them, uh, peeling back the bark, is a way to uh, tell whether that's what you've got or not. So in this case, they've, they've uh, used a draw knife or some kind of knife and um, pull back the bark, and you can see that uh, serpentine uh, tra trailing there that's characteristic of these these beetles. Um, <clears throat> on a larger scale, this is what you're going to see with emerald ash borer. Uh, you're going to see the canopy thinning, you see at the top of the tree there, and uh, epicormic branching, the, the very dense new foliage, new, new uh, vegetation lower down in the tree, sometimes at the base of the tree. So this is, this is the typical sign of emerald ash borer damage. Just another view there at a different at a different stage of infestation. You can see that the uh, infestation has progressed from the first slide. So um, this is not good news to see this uh, if you're in emerald ash borer country. Um, there are some going to be lots of insects that are confused with emerald ash borer, and we we have been monitoring for these beetles for a couple of years. And I know whenever the word gets out about we want people to be on the lookout for these beetles, we get lots of reports of beetles, all kinds of beetles that people are seeing on trees and even some D-shaped holes. And um, it, it never turns out to be emerald ash borer, or it's not till, till now. And, um, but it's, there are a lot of other things that can resemble uh, emerald.
Emerald Ash Borer if you don't know exactly what to look for. Ash and Privet Borer is one example. This is a round-headed borer. Uh, it's in the family Cerambicidae, the uh, very common family of, of uh, wood-infesting beetles. Notice the larva. It doesn't look anything like the emerald ash borer. It's a lot thicker. It doesn't have those bell-shaped uh, segments, body segments on it. Um, and, and the hole is, you know, it could be a little bit wider than an emerald ash borer hole. But when you look at the trails under the bark, you don't see that serpentine back and forth. They're, they're a little more direct. They've got branches on them, but this particular one does not have the same pattern that you would see on, on EAB. Uh, Red-headed ash borer is a very common uh, borer pest in ash here in Texas. Um, this is not anything that we're especially concerned about. It's always attacks trees, especially trees under stress. So um, this is another one that you might come across. This is the larva of emerald ash borer again. It, or I'm sorry, red-headed ash borer does not look anything like uh, emerald ash borer. It's not as flat. Doesn't have the bell-shaped segments. And the probably the the um, best thing to look at when you see holes in a tree is look at the shape of the hole. If it's a round-headed borer like uh, red-headed ash borer, it'll be like the bottom picture, the oval to round shape uh, where the beetle had chewed its way out of the, uh, the tree. Um, if it's a perfectly round hole, it could be a clear wing borer. We have several species of those that can attack ash. Um, sometimes the and clear wing borers are actually uh, moths, and they will frequently leave their pupil skins in the hole when they emerge, at least until the rain breaks it up and, and washes it away. But uh, if you see a little skin sticking out of a hole, it's definitely not an emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer hole is going to be D-shaped, and the width is going to be pretty consistently about three millimeters wide. So the size is not going to vary. You're not going to see lots of big holes and small holes. They'll almost always be just right around three millimeters in size. So get get the ruler out if you're if you're looking at holes and uh, make sure it's consistent with emerald ash borer before you report it in. So let's talk a little about where we're going here. Um, Texas has been uh, participating in a U.S. Department of Agriculture monitoring program uh, put on by Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS. Um, they have paid us the last uh, five to six years to go out and set up trap lines around the state of Texas. This is uh, my employee, uh, Dr. Charlie Helpert, who's worked on the project for about five years, and he's putting up what we call a purple trap. And uh, these are just traps. There's giant sticky traps coated with glue, and they're hung up in trees. And um, there's often a little tag on the tree that you see here in this picture that shows that this is an emerald ash borer trap. Not always, but uh, usually there's a tag there. And um, so if you're traveling around East Texas and uh, see one of these giant purple kites hanging from a tree, uh, it is part of the emerald ash borer monitoring program. Um, it's, it's a rather a crude way to monitor for emerald ash borer, and it's not the only way that uh, we will detect these, these beetles, but it is a way, and it's part of our early warning system. Um, this, this map, I hope you can see some of the, uh, all the dots on here. This map shows where these traps have been deployed in the state of Texas. The lighter color dots just indicate lower trap densities, less, less lower priority. The uh, darker the dot, the, the brown dots would indicate where most of the trapping effort is being directed. And it's, it's kind of an odd map, but it's, it's based on uh, the uh, distribution of and computer models that show where emerald ash borer is more likely to show up. And uh, usually counties with more camping and human presence would, would score a little higher. But of course, it's also overlaid by the frequency of ash, uh, natural ash populations in these different counties. So there are some hopeful signs looking for the future. Um, so far, the states where emerald ash borer has been so devastating are states that have a much higher percentage of forest canopy devoted to ash than Texas. Uh, in Texas, the density of ash trees is lower compared to these other states. It's generally less than 2% of the forest canopy in areas where it is uh, fairly common in Texas. Uh, that's compared to uh, cities like Chicago where uh, approximately 12% of the trees in this whole city are ash, Minneapolis 15%, Iowa 16%, similar to Pennsylvania and Missouri. Uh, Colorado has a surprisingly high number of ash 
percentage of ash trees in its urban trees. But in Texas, the, the rate, the percentage tends to be a lot lower. And you may say, well, I know I've got a lot of ash in my town, and that's, that's very possible. It's going to vary from site to site. But in general, uh, this is not going to help the, the borers uh, spread. The spread might be a little slower in Texas, and certainly the impact will be a little less, in, a lot less in Texas than it is in some of these other states. Um, this is just a map put out by the Texas a and Forest Service showing uh, computer estimates of um, ash density in different parts of the state. And again, you can see uh, this northeast corner of Texas is the highest, but really ash pretty much all throughout the eastern third of the state of Texas in some, in some degrees. Another hopeful sign uh, regarding uh, these uh, borers is that we do have biological controls that affect the boar populations. You know, I mentioned that in, in China and Asia where these, these borers are native, nobody knows about them. And that's oftentimes a sign that they're under very good biological control by natural enemies. And uh, some of the best biological control agents um, for insect pests, especially exotic insect pests, are parasitic wasps. Um, and this, this shows a picture of uh, a little wasp uh, laying its eggs. This is a, uh, an ovipositor. This uh, long, skinny tube coming down from the abdomen is actually the egg-laying tool for this little wasp. And she's laying her eggs in the burrow of an ash borer underneath the bark that she's detected through smell and, and probably a feel. And, uh, and you can see this is kind of a neat picture. Uh, you can see one of the ash borer uh, cavities, the, the uh, tunnels, that's just full with these little parasitic larvae that have probably digested by now that uh, ash borer that was in the, in the uh, tunnel. So um, there are some parasitic wasps that can do this. There's actually three species that we have now imported from China, We've gone over and tried to find species that we do not have that are native parasites of this particular pest and brought them to the U.S. and released them here in the U.S. There, we also know that there are at least two U.S. species of parasitic wasps uh, that feed on other borers that appear to have adapted to emerald ash borer and are, are providing some control in the infested uh, states. So that's good news. And um, in a recent research papers that I attended uh, at the Animological Society of America last year, um, Researchers are reporting in some areas that emerald ash borer densities have decreased as much as five-fold after the establishment of these parasitoids. So um, nature is beginning to fight back if we give her a chance here. Um, and uh, this is, even though it's a little early to dis determine whether these releases are going to make a major difference, there is some promising signs that, that we might uh, have nature a little more on our side in the next few years. And that's something we can hold out for as we try to stem the tide of, of emerald ash borer invading our, our urban trees. Another hopeful sign is that there is some host plant resistance potential. Um, I mentioned in China these are not a major pest and part of, part of that comes from uh, some of these tree species that have adapted and become resistant to emerald ash borer in, the, in its native home. So there are some Asian, uh, there is some uh, Asian genetics that are out there that um, might help us in breeding programs. Uh, there's research going on right now to try to determine what the genetic source of resistance amongst these trees to the, to the borers are. And um, in the future, we might be looking at some conventional crosses between uh, Asian and U.S. tree, tree species um, and even possibly even implantation of genes into uh, trees to more quickly develop uh, resistant plant material. But, this is just a picture of Manchurian ash that uh, is growing here in the U.S. And, and very healthy and undamaged by emerald ash borer. Um, in a way, we're a little lucky here in Texas because we're not bearing the brunt of a new invasion. We're, we're uh, basically at the other end of an invasion that's been going on for more than 10 years. And uh, as a result, we have the benefits of more than 10 years of research on this beetle uh, before it gets here to Texas. We know now that there are multiple effective treatment methods, including at least one organic method for those of you who are concerned about uh, having an organic option. Um, the biocontrol agents, as I just mentioned, are maybe increasing in effectiveness, so we might be able to make, take some advantage of the knowledge there. 
and help us as we face this beetle. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, chemical management goes, there are some options. Uh, the general strategy being used now, uh, developed in the upper Midwest and being uh, passed on to other states, is that uh, we know that it really doesn't pay to treat trees until you're at least 15, uh, no more than 15 miles from a known infestation of emerald ash borer. So if you're thinking about running home today and uh, starting to treat your trees with insecticides so you, you can prevent the ash before, before, before it gets there, research has shown it really doesn't pay to treat those trees until you know that the ash borer is close, close by. Um, the infestations are likely to be present in your area um, before they're noticed, up to four to six years, but still that 15-mile uh, rule, it takes, it takes them four to six years to move 15 miles on the ground. So um, <clears throat> the good news about these insecticides is that treated trees may survive and be attractive for many years. Uh, it's possible to preserve these trees for extended periods of time. Um, but you will need annual or biannual treatment uh, for, for, for the foreseeable future. Until we can figure out biological ways to control these beetles, you may have to be treating your trees once every year or every two years. Um, the short term, and this, and this admittedly is just a short term game, but this short term survival strategy of treating trees that will allow times for people to generate funds to remove uh, the tree and replace it with something else or else possibly to wait for a good biological control to come along. So um, just a little bit of overview on some of the research that's been done in other places and acknowledgments to Rainbow Tree Care who's funded some of this research and Purdue University who's conducted some of it in Indiana. This is a picture uh, taken by Dr. Cliff Sadoff at Purdue. Um, this is a city park in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. And um, he's got trees pointed out. There's, there's treated trees and untreated trees. And I think you can see there's a huge difference between those, those two types of trees uh, in the park. So the treatment does make a difference in this case with the insecticide emamectin benzoate. And uh, this gets back to when should you start considering treating uh, a tree. So here we have an infestation zone right here. And you can see the trees are either dead or they're, or they're thinning out from infestation with, with beetles. Now we can, we can guesstimate that within 15 miles of those known infestations, there are at risk, highly at risk trees. So if you're within 15 miles of a known infestation, your trees are at risk. And this is, this is the preventive treatment uh, zone here. Um, and keep in mind also that moving infested firewood from these these infested areas is something we're going to have to deal with education-wise. People need to be made aware that, that when, when ash borer is in the area, ash trees are dying, you do not cut and move that firewood because that's just going to spread the infestation. Um, so beyond 15 miles from the known infest, infestation are emerald ash borer what they're calling uh, outlier trees. There could possibly be some trees out here, but they're, they're a low risk. These trees are much lower risk. So generally, we're recommending uh, treating trees aggressively with insecticides only within that 15-mile zone. When is tree removal the best option? So one of the, one of the um, strategies that communities have um, employed in the upper Midwest is some cities have said, well, we're just going to cut down all our ash trees. Well, it turns out that that really doesn't seem to to slow the, the spread of the infestation very much. Um, generally, the rule that's, that's uh, been found to work the best is to wait until you get, um, get trees that might not be salvageable, that there's no hope for treating them effectively. And the, and the definition for that is trees that are greater than 30 to 40 percent defoliated. If, if your tree is 40 percent defoliated, you probably are going to want to cut that tree down. But if it's, if it's slightly affected or not affected yet, those trees are salvageable and, and can be tr successfully treated. Um, they call this scale the Smitley scale for David Smitley, researcher at, at uh, Michigan State University who's developed it. Um, I know these pictures are not that great, but at least you get an idea that you know after you see a bunch of these trees, there it is uh, possible to determine the overall percent defoliation and, and choose which trees are likely unsalvageable. 
but just plain removing all trees does not, we know from experience, it does not slow the spread of the borer into new areas. So um, as far as professional trunk injection treatment options, the best product right now on the market seems to be Emma Mectin Benzoate. It's sold as Arborjet's triage or triage, uh, every, and it's put used on a tree every two to three years. Um, the other option, another very good option, is imidacloprid, sold under the names Merit, Zytec, Imicide, Imijet, and uh, this is a treatment that will only last about one to maybe two years. And uh, I mentioned that uh, there is an organic option. The organic insecticide is azadiractin. It's an extract from the neem tree, um, sold under the trade names azosol and triazin. And that is an annual treatment. It's, it's nice because it's an organic type treatment for customers that want that, but it's going to need to be applied every year if the tree is a high risk tree. Um, so there are some other options uh, besides injection. There are also soil and bark treatment options. And again, we've got Im imidacloprid is available for this. Um, at the high rate, uh, preferably in the spring, we do this as a soil injection or soil drench each year. Uh, Dinotefuran is another very good product. Now, if you're, familiar, if you're not familiar with these two uh, insecticides, they both belong to the neonicotinoid class of insecticides, which tend to be pretty water soluble. But uh, dinotefuran is something like 30 or 40 times as water soluble as imidacloprid, so it has a much higher rate of being pulled up into a tree um, and is just, um, for some pests, is more effective. It gets more thoroughly throughout a tree than imidacloprid. But both products are working well. Um, you want to apply your soil injection or a drench within two feet of the trunk. A lot of people say go out around the drip line of the tree and put your applications out. and and the research seems to show that just keeping that application in close to the trunk of the tree is the best way to get the insecticide into the tree. Uh, a word about amomectin benzoate. Uh, this product is given 98 to 99 percent control for up to two years as an injection treatment. Now that's not available as a, as a drench or soil injection. It's a direct tree injection product. Um, an interesting thing about these products is in addition to killing the larvae in the tree, which has always been very difficult with borers, but they do kill larvae in the tree, but they also, uh, because these are uh, xylem transmitted, uh, translocated insecticides, much of these insecticides will go up into the leaves of the tree, and adult beetles, it turns out, feed on these leaves on the top of the tree, and uh, in the process of feeding on the leaves, we actually are killing adult beetles. So we kind of get this uh, protective effect uh, we're finding out in communities when, when lots of trees are treated with these treatments. So people that don't treat their trees are actually get benefiting from people that do because you're actually lowering the population of the adult beetles in a community. Uh, but the, the primary purpose of these treatments is to kill the larvae in the cambium layer. Um, now, emomectin benzoate is a restricted-use pesticide, so it cannot be put out by a homeowner that doesn't have, is not a certified pesticide applicator. And again, it's sold by Arborjet. Uh, imidacloprid, uh, research has shown that the 2x rate is the most effective. You get, some, you get some options on the label. You can do a 1x or a 2x rate, and the 2x rate is the one that works the best. And you're going to get about 90%, 6% control with that. Um, there is an injectable form or a drench, drench form, and these are the product names for those. Um, and this one also kills adult beetles feeding on the leaves. So both, uh, both amomectin, benzoate, and imidacloprid do translocate to the leaves and, and have that protective effect. Um, spring applications, turns out, are more effective than fall applications. And uh, dinotefuran is also available as a drench, as I mentioned earlier, but it can also be used as a trunk spray because of its very high water solubility. It can move, actually move through the bark or roots into the cambium zone, and, but it's most effective as a bark spray with smaller trees that have thin bark. And you might get 96% control in those, but again, the larger trees, once that corky bark starts to develop, you're not going to get very good penetration. Much better to do a drench. And it also kills adult beetles feeding on the leaves. Azadiractin, uh, considered to be an organic insecticide because it comes from a natural source, comes from the neem tree. It is an extract of the neem, neem seed. Um, 
the young larvae die in these treated trees, and, and there's about 75 to 80 percent control in trees that are treated every two years. But the recommendation is to treat these trees annually if you're going to use azadiractin, especially if you're under high pressure and high, high infestation risk areas. And this is just some data that kind of uh, backs up the uh, recommendations I just gave you. Um, just to, to point out, this is uh, trees that were treated with uh, Merit or imidacloprid, either as a Merit or Zytec formulation. And uh, this is the percent canopy decline in, in years where the uh, trees were treated with the 1x rate. And you can see that uh, we're looking at trees that, are, uh, that have been treated annually and they, there are a percentage of them where the canopy is declining and the canopy average decline here was up around 60 percent which is not good. I mean the tree is being protected by these insecticides but it's a higher canopy decline. Generally they they want to see less 30 percent or less canopy decline. The 2x rate, um, Zytec 2x spring and fall, both stayed under that 30 percent foliation and the 1x with merit, if applied in the spring, actually did a pretty decent job also. So spring application is better than fall in general, but a 2x rate will cover both spring and fall if you, if you need to use that. Um, with amomectin benzoate, um, again, this just is a rate, rate treatment and that higher rate of amomectin, uh, 0.8 gallons AI per, per inch, gave the best control. Now homeowners have the option to be able to treat their trees as well um, and they're going to have, principally they're going to have for that use imidacloprid. Um, to do this we recommend removing the mulch or sod or any kind of organic matter from that two foot zone that you're going to treat the tree and then you can be mixed up in a bucket and just drench the, the base of the tree uh, within two feet. Very effective, easy to do type treatment and, but it does have to be done annually. Um, this is just an example of a homeowner uh, imidacloprid product, the Bayer Advanced 12-month tree and in shrub insect control. Bonide also makes uh, this product, and as we get emerald ash borer moving into the area, we're probably going to see more products that are labeled for that use down here in, in uh, Texas insecticide uh, distribution um, places. But these are some of the, the names of uh, consumer products that are available. Fertilome, high yield. Uh, Optrol, I'm not familiar with that one, uh, Ortho uh, Max tree and shrub insect control. So a good, a good selection of products for homeowners. Um, now Dino, uh, Greenlight has recently uh, been sold and I'm not sure if this product is still available. It used to be, Safari used to be available here in Texas. Uh, we may start to see this emerald ash borer killer version of Greenlight come in, but Dinotefuran may be available also and either of those products are, are very good. Um, so that's what I had to cover today. Uh, I just need to acknowledge uh, Dr. Phil Nixon uh, with the University of Illinois Cooperative Extension. He was very helpful. Um, the folks up in the Midwest have been through all of this and uh, were very uh, supportive and helpful with providing information. So we're, we're leaning heavily on the work that's been done by others in our battle against emerald ash borer. Uh, Patrick Anderson with Rainbow Tree Care was helpful in providing some images. Dr. Joe LaForest, uh, University of Georgia in Bugwood, and Dr. Dan Herms uh, did a lot of re has done a lot of the research uh, on this particular pest. So uh, with that, um, Mung Mung, I've covered what I wanted to cover today. Are, are, do we have some questions that uh, do we have time for some questions?